Hi everyone, I just want to put disclaimer out there and let you know that this topic may be triggering for some listeners and if you don't feel comfortable listening, that is completely fine. Also to let you know, we are not experts in any way, we are just two people expressing our opinions on the subject matter. If you are experiencing any level of hate crime within your community, please reach out to someone to talk to or your friends and family. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome to the Belinda Norm podcast. Today I have a very, very, very special guest and a very good friend of mine across the pond, Serena. Serena, please, can you introduce yourself? Hello. Hi, Belinda. So good to see you. Um, (laughs) Apologies, everyone, for not being on camera. I just told Belinda I'm having Wi-Fi trouble and did not do my face today. So (laughs) you just get my voice for this episode. But hopefully on a different one, I will be on video (laughs) and uh me and Serena go way back we knew each other from university when she was an exchange student from the U.S. and we met each other at a dance society right hip-hop dance yes (laughs) (laughs) it was a hip-hop class and I think it was one of our friends um Rewaj uh, actually spoke to you first and then it was me and the other person that joined in the conversation as well and the rest is like history and we've just been friends ever since so (laughs) that's uh, that's our backstory (laughs) but yeah um, so for today's episode we're actually gonna touch on a topic that's quite serious and something that's been on my mind for quite a while so um i thought serena would be the best person to do this obviously because with the situation that we are going to be talking about is the asian hate crime currently happening in the midst of covid and the pandemic and everything obviously serena you're an asian woman yourself so i thought just talking to to you would be best uh how do you feel about that Absolutely. So <clears throat> I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, since the um, the hate crime that everyone's talking about happened last week. You know, there was a gunman in Atlanta that went to three different salons and spas and killed eight people, six of them being Asian women. Since then, there's been such an outcry from, you know, the Asian American community but also communities across the world that are looking at this and just asking ourselves and themselves, why is this happening? You know, how could this be happening? And why aren't people calling it what it is, a hate crime? There were many media outlets in the United States who just were not, you know, being forthcoming or not being comfortable calling it a hate crime. And that's been a center of discussion for many people in my social circles, um, online, social media. That's what you've been seeing a lot about the trending hashtag stop Asian hate. Um, That's all over the place as well. Uh, As you mentioned, I am an Asian woman, but I am a mixed Asian woman. So my mom's Filipino, my dad is white. And that in and of itself has caused me to have, you know, a lot of different feelings around everything that's going on because A, I'm not a woman or I'm not an Asian woman of Southeast descent, right? Philippines is kind of a bit lower down. We fall in the gray area of Southeast Asia or Pacific Islander. Like we are Asian, but not necessarily Southeast Asian. And I'm not full Asian. So those two factors are something, some things that have been floating around in my mind um, as I've been digesting everything that's happening uh, in the States and elsewhere. So when you first heard about the shooting in Atlanta with uh, the eight victims, um, how did you feel? Like, what was your first reaction when you first heard about it? Yeah, my first reaction, I actually heard about it um, in a parking lot getting boba. (laughs) (laughs) I was on the road. Yeah. Um, on a road trip last week. And um, my boyfriend just said, Hey, did you see the news? And I pulled up Instagram and started looking at people's stories. And that's the first instance I had of seeing what was happening in Atlanta. So I think my first initial reaction was just shock, um, followed shortly by like intense sadness um, and pain, just reading that and hurt. Like the anger didn't come for a while. It was mostly just such hurt and yeah sadness 
a lot of pain, I imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you feel that a lot of the victims are always the elderly, the kids, women, basically just the vulnerable? And why do you feel like people can target those kind of people, if those populations, if you know what I mean? Like, do you feel it's always the vulnerable people that gets targeted and attacked? Or do you feel like it, it's all kinds of people? It's just that maybe some of them are unreported and we don't know. It's just that the ones that make it to the news are always the vulnerable ones. What do you think? Uh, do you mean in hate crimes in particular or any yeah. crime? Or <laughs> the Asian, like Asian hate crime towards us, basically. I see. I see. So that's an interesting question. I never really considered if the vulnerable were more targeted Um, I would agree that in like recent um, attacks that the media has covered has been more so older people, but you know, the victims in this case, they weren't all old. They were thirties, forties, fifties. They weren't necessarily the old and, or the elderly and the vulnerable. Um, I also think that young people especially are targeted or are the targets of microaggressions a lot of the time, just, you know, in our social circles or at the workplace or just in our day-to-day lives, maybe we're not getting like pushed around or shot or beaten, but there are different types of hate crimes that all, all types of people deal with, or not all types, all ages of Asian people deal with on a day-to-day basis, you know? So I wouldn't say that it's just the vulnerable that are targeted, I think. Um, it applies to everyone in the communities. Yeah. So, okay, I got this stat- like this statistic from a newspaper somewhere, but let me know what you think. So I've read that Asian hate crimes has increased by nearly 150% in 2020, and they're mostly in cities like New York and L.A., Are you kind of like surprised to hear like big cities like that that are usually known for being quite diverse to have such a huge number of like Asian hate crimes, even though they're so diverse? Um, Definitely not surprised. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. Part of the reason being um, is just, you know, in the big cities, there is a higher concentration of people who are not white. So on the flip side, if you go to smaller towns, there aren't that many Asian people. (laughs) So it would make sense that a lot of the hate crimes are happening where there's large populations of minorities, right? Mm -hmm. So since, um, since Donald Trump, thank God, is not president anymore, but while he was president, there was an uptick in hate crimes against Asian Americans specifically because of the way that he spoke about Asian Americans or Asians or China, you know, he had a, he had a thing for China. Um, And then when COVID happened, just the fact that he's calling it the China virus, the Kung flu virus, you know, that rhetoric goes a long way for people feeling like it's okay to talk negatively about Asian Americans, about not even Asians who live in America about any type of minority. So it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that hate crimes went up even in the big cities that we would consider to be liberal or diverse. Yeah. So I know like, you know, you mentioned that you're mixed, you're half Filipino and you're half white. Um, Do you feel like sometimes you feel a little bit torn? Like, I I don't know if it's um, easy how to like explain it but like do you feel that do you feel that sometimes you don't fully fit in with the Asian community I mean I'm okay I'm talking about like maybe before all of this Asian hate hate crime maybe because like because you're mixed there are some people who would accept you as Asian and then there may be some white people who accept you as white because you're mixed of something but do you ever feel like I don't know where I belong because I'm from the best of both worlds um so yeah I'm just uh interested to see like as a mixed woman, um, do you feel like, uh, do you, do you fit in, in certain communities or do you feel like you just, you just, you float around and you get along with everyone? And everything? <laughs> sure. Do? Sure. So this is a question that I think, um, every mixed person has thought about and <laughs> I definitely don't claim to speak for all of us, but growing up, I never considered myself white and I never considered myself Asian. I've always considered myself mixed 
which is an odd space to be in because you're right. I do feel like I don't fit in either side. Um, I am white passing. So I get the privileges that come with being white or white passing or even ambiguous enough that people don't know what I am. Yeah. And that's something that I grew up with. You know, I always got the question, what are you? <laughs> where are you from? Blah, 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 blah. And depending on where I was, the answers people would guess were always different. So a funny example is I worked in a Turkish restaurant for maybe three years during high school. People thought I was Turkish or Middle Eastern. Oh I don't, God. I look Turkish or Middle Eastern in any way, but just being in that environment, that's what they assumed, um, which was always strange to me. Uh, and then, you know, this is a bit off topic, but when I was in high school, I didn't have a ton of Asian friends just based on the community that I grew up in. And so when I went to college, I joined the Filipino club to connect with my roots. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I didn't ever feel like I fully fit in there either, just because I didn't necessarily get all the inside jokes or the cultural references, because my mom is pretty Americanized for a Filipino woman. She came over when she was 16. So she's been in the States longer than she ever was in the Philippines. I don't think she has a very strong accent, though I have friends that would disagree. <laughs> um, and I grew up pretty, you know, Americanized with a Filipino twist is how I would put it. So I'm very proud to be mixed. I'm very proud of both sides of um, my family. But it is interesting to come into discussions of race especially this discussion that's, you know, kind of in a way, Asians versus white, because it was a white man that shot all these people. Um, and I sit in an odd space of like wanting to support and lift up, you know, all of my Asian sisters, um, but also acknowledging the fact that my privilege extends into the white community as well. So how do you balance your thoughts? How do you balance your words where you want to relate to everyone's hurt, but you don't want to add to it and you don't want to defend, but I also don't want to like, you know, hurt my dad <laughs> by any of the words that I say, right? So you, you need to balance just... I feel like I need to balance my thoughts. And even now I'm sure I'll say something that'll offend someone in some community because <laughs> that's, you know. <laughs> the internet, love. It's just the internet. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I do consider myself um, lucky to sit in the position that I am in where I can look into both worlds. But you're right, you don't fully belong in either, which has always been interesting as well. Yeah. What about what do you think of the people who, let's say they were to go towards a full Asian person who is born and raised in the US, but they still, and they call them whitewashed or they're not Asian because they're not that stereotype that they had in their head. Like how, like, what do you think of all of that to, to people who say, oh, you're so whitewashed or, oh, you're this or you're that? What do you think? I think that's just ignorance, <laughs> you know, and um, whitewashed is a strange term. Like, that's why I said Americanized, right? Because America is not, um, not synonymous with white and it never has been and it never will be <clears throat> as much as some people want to push it that way, right? Like, this is a country with a ton of different cultures, and to say that you're whitewashed just because you may act in a way that is like, I don't know, seems non-Asian, like, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Like, what? what are you trying to say? Well, you know what they're trying to say. They're trying to be mean about it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just feel like anyone who goes, you're not really Asian, you're whitewashed, like they're ignorant. And you can try to educate them, you can ignore them. Like it's definitely a personal preference on how you want to act if someone is going to say such nonsense in your face. <laughs> so 
on the topic of like stereotypes um, on Asian people, what do you think are the stereotypes of Asian women? Because obviously in the media, we see a lot of like Asian women being so hypersexualized and just seeing as these like sexual beings and they are just sex workers that's out to get like a person's money or get, the, get into their pockets. Like, do you feel how much of that has affected basically the West and the media and how people view Asian women in particular? I mean, a ton, of course. The way that media portrays any group of people is going to heavily influence how society views them, as sad as it is. Um, Historically, as you mentioned, Asian women have been shown as sexualized or as submissive or like submissive is a big one, uh, I think, that has been shown in media for years and years and years. And I'd like to think that there are shows or movies that, you know, are changing nowadays and that are opening roles or opening um, characters that are more well-rounded. But even in recent years, if you look at like just a random one that came to mind, Guardians of the Galaxy, there is one Asian woman in that movie and she is portrayed as like a submissive, quiet, um, you know, non-aggressive person. And that movie was made, what? Well, I don't know, less than 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago. (laughs) Yeah, less than TV. (laughs) Yeah, so of course it affects the way that people will view uh, not only Asian women, but any minority or any type of person. Um, So I know that there have been a lot of Asian actors and actresses like coming out and saying that, you know, hey, Hollywood, you need to change. You need to be better. You need to better serve our communities. So hopefully that's something that will happen in the future. But I think I think a lot of the responsibility of changing that narrative falls on the people who consume the media. Mm. So, you know, anyone who's watching the movies or anyone that like is really into specific Asian cultures, the the K-pop fans or like the anime fans (laughs) or the weeaboos, is that offensive? I'm not sure. Um, Like all of those people, like they should also be standing up and defending uh, Asian Americans and Asian communities because like they obviously have a vested interest in it, but not only that, like we're all human and they should be caring about all different types. But I have been seeing a lot of people saying like, hey, yes, Asian Americans are standing up for ourselves or like Asians across the world are standing up to stop Asian hate, but it's not only us that should be advocating you know, like anyone who consumes any part of our culture should also be, their voices should be in the mix. Yeah, of course. Um, so I know that, like, I think this was a year ago, I believe. Um, I don't know if you heard it in the news, but there was a Thai man who has been attacked and then he actually died from that attack. And I think he was in SF, like he was in, he was from San Francisco. Have you heard about this? I think so. It rings a bell. Yeah, I think his name was like Vishma Rata. Oh God, oh, it was, Thai names are so long. Rata Napak or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think he was like pushed or shoved by someone who was obviously bigger than him and a lot stronger than him. Mm-hmm. And um, he was shoved so hard to the ground that basically he died, um, unfortunately. And obviously that struck a chord with me because I am Thai myself. And then to mm-hmm. see like an elderly Thai man, that could easily be my dad or my grand my granddad even. So yeah. with that being said, do you ever feel like you're scared for your family? Like obviously your, your Asian family, um, whenever they step outside, do you ever feel like, okay, I'm scared whenever they go out into the world because I don't know who's going to attack them or who's going to protect them when they're out? Do you ever feel that fear? I, f- I don't think I fear, I feel the fear as strongly as others. One reason being um, my grandparents are dead. They passed a number of years ago. And I, as bad as it sounds, like my Filipino family 
doesn't look like super Southeast Asian or the, like the people that are getting attacked or at least that the media is publicizing, they don't look like my family. Mm-hmm. So it could be my family. Like it could happen to my family, but I do think that my fear isn't as great as like my Chinese friends, my Vietnamese friends, my Korean friends who do have like elderly grandparents still alive and elderly parents. Like, of course I worry about my mom and I worry about my dad, but I don't think I worry as much of them being targeted as a hate crime as others in my community might. Yeah. Have you heard any stories from your friends who have experienced some sort of, or maybe their their elderly relatives who has experienced it? Yeah, I haven't heard stories of like my friend's family being harassed necessarily, but I do know that so many of my friends are worried about their elderly parents or grandparents. Like one of my friends made a post where she's worried that her dad like might cough too loud as he's prone to do. He's an older man, (laughs) you know, he coughs with a big old cough, but she's scared that because, you know, he is Asian, And if he coughs too loudly, that someone might take offense or someone might hurt him because of that. And that's insane that we have to worry about our parents coughing too loud just because of the way they look and then getting hurt because of it, right? So a number of people in my social circles have been sharing their thoughts, their stories, their fears, um, and we're all just trying to support each other at this time and help, you know, try to allow space for whatever feelings anyone is having um, to be shared, to be validated, um, and to hopefully be, you know, calmed a bit by having discussions and just like talking about options or what can be done or, um, sorry, I'm getting slacks on my work (laughs) computer, so I just got distracted. (laughs) Um, But anyway, Yes, having conversations. My fear isn't as great as others' fear could be. Um, but of course, I still worry for my parents. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's quite a sad situation to be in, to have to be afraid for your parents, you know? Um, yeah. I'm curious, though, Belinda, what are the conversations like in the UK around um, Stop Asian Hate? Like, I you know, you're one of my links <laughs> to the UK. So what do you see in your social circles or what are people talking about over there? Do you know what? It's really strange because I don't hear much about Asian hate here or maybe because, I think maybe it's because there hasn't been any or a lot of reports of Asian, British Asian people getting attacked or getting mm. hurt. The last time I ever heard an Asian person being attacked was in Oxford Circus and he was a student and I think it was late at night and I think it was like a group of people that attacked him and obviously they were calling him Chinese virus or get that thing Mm -hmm. away from here or you know all those like racial slurs Mm -hmm. and um, yeah he has to be taken to hospital because he was beaten up that badly and another thing is is that he was Thai as well so I'm like Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're just targeting anyone who they think looks Chinese and just assume yes. that they all look the same so unfortunately I don't really hear that much about you know supporting the Asian communities in the UK it's, yeah mm-hmm. I, maybe maybe there is a lot going on but we just don't know about it and that the, the news don't even cover it um, so yeah that's why I wanted to hear more about what's going on from your side because I feel like there's so much more going on and that you guys are so much more vocal than we are I wanted to just hear from yours and hopefully this will bring someone forward from the UK in the Asian community to say okay I've I've been attacked and I want to come forward and say that I have because I know there are some people that can be quite um you know maybe shy about it they might be embarrassed about it because you know in, in Asian families we've always been taught to just be quiet and not cause you know a storm or like disturb anything but mm-hmm. I don't think this is the time to be quiet right now so yeah that's what's going on in the UK <laughs> hmm. it's interesting yeah it's I mean it makes sense that 
in America, there would be like more things being talked about or shared. Like literally when I go on Instagram, um, that's all my friend's stories are right now, are sharing resources, sharing ways that you can be an ally, sharing news articles. Um, I have multiple friends that have set up fundraisers already to donate um, to not only the families that have been affected, um, not only you know, um, organizations that help Asian Americans or like elderly Asian people, but also specifically organizations that target helping, um, that target programs that provide mental health assistance to Asian Americans. So my friends have mobilized <laughs> within a week of just really getting out there and trying to educate, trying to support, um, and I, it's really similar to what I saw back last July during um, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. It's a similar storm, I guess, of sharing, of um, just trying to do our part to help in any way. And what's been really lovely is seeing my friends who aren't Asian also step up and ask, how can I be an ally? I have a couple of friends that have signed up for courses that you know, will teach them how to be better allies. Like as a white person, what can I do to <laughs> better support minorities in my community? Or what can I do to make people around me feel safer? Or how can I use my privilege to better my community? So it's just been amazing seeing people take a lot of different um, paths, but want to help in whatever way they can. Yeah. What do you say to people who say that, oh, this isn't our fight? Or there are some people that I've heard on social media saying that um, the Asian community hasn't really done anything for us or that they have lived or survived of, of us. What do you, what's your response to that when people say that, oh, this isn't our fight? Yeah, I actually had a call with one of my friends earlier today kind of about that specific <laughs> um, phenomenon, how there are different minority communities. Um, I know some folks in the Black community would say, you know, the Asian community wasn't there when we needed them. Like, why would we stand up for them now? And it's hurtful to hear. Um, one, because I do know myself and others who did you know stand up and try to be an ally and advocate and help um, the Black community during the George Floyd uh, or the Black Lives Matter protests last year. And we're continuing to educate ourselves and just try to make our communities and work environments and social environments better for anyone who's in them. Um, and on the other side, it's like, it's difficult to hear anyone say like, my trauma is greater than your trauma, right? Because yes, it could be, or maybe no, it's not. But in the end, does it matter whose trauma is greater? Shouldn't we just be trying to support anyone, everyone who needs our help? So, I do think that there could be some resentment towards the Asian community only because historically Asians have been the model minority, mm -hmm. right? Where you're told to keep your head down, things will be okay. Like probably there'll be others that have it worse than you. Um, don't make a fuss, don't make a ruckus, right? Yeah. I do think that young people now are kind of tossing that mentality away where you can't expect anything to get better if you accept the way things are now, right? Like sure, maybe being the model minority means that you're not targeted as much or you're not hurt as much, but what about like our black brothers and sisters or the other minorities or other people of color around us? Should we not also be helping them? So my hope is that, I mean, as bad as it sounds, this hate crime is bringing attention to stopping Asian hate and the crimes against the Black community did bring attention to the pain that's there. So as our voices keep swelling and as they keep getting louder, as we keep calling for things to change, 
hopefully all those voices will come together into one big voice, you know, and it's not like the Asian community yelling or the black community yelling or any other community yelling. It's all of us yelling that things need to get better. Yeah. That's the hope, right? Yeah. So you mentioned like the model person. I think they use that. It was like the model. Uh, model minority. Yeah. Model minority. I, I, I remember someone saying this to me that this is way before this whole hate crime was coming on. It's like, I was, I was talking to someone at one point and I was just like, how I do know like Asian people do get racial slurs and like get some sort of racial harassment. I, for, for one, I have been racially harassed before. Well, okay. It's quite a big word to say like harassment, but I have had some sort of racist tendencies towards me, but I never made a huge ruckus about it. Cause obviously that's how we've always been taught growing up. But uh, we've we never made it into such a big issue like, you know, with the whole Black Lives uh, movement. They have like a it's it's a very serious um, thing. And obviously that's something that we should all care about. But I, I once had someone come up to me and just say like, well, you know, we should be really happy that we're not in you know that kind of situation because, you know, we're, we're doing well. We're keeping quiet. We're doing our own thing. We have nothing to complain about. And then I thought about it and I was like, yeah, that's. That's true to some extent. I see what they mean, but I feel like the racist tendencies from other people is very subtle towards Asian community. What do you think to people who say like, oh, we don't have anything to complain about because we are the model minority. We're like the perfect race or perfect race. Mm. Um, I mean, if they don't have anything to complain about, like good on them um, <laughs> for not having to deal with anything, right? Yeah. But like I said, nothing's going to change if we don't talk about it, if we don't bring it up, if we don't call it out. So even the smallest little things like microaggressions, I think are worth calling out. Um, even if it's just sharing your story with your communities or your social media or whatever, just to make people aware of like, Hey, this is something that happened to me. It may not be as big as like being beaten or being murdered, but it's something that still shouldn't be happening because microaggressions do build up over time. Like a really small one is you shouldn't really ask people like, where are you from? Right? Like it's kind of rude. I don't mind it necessarily, but I do know that some people do mind it. And so even me saying like, hey, it's maybe not polite to ask that. I'll tell you, but maybe, you know, rethink how you're phrasing that question in the future. It's just setting up a better environment for the people that come after us. And I don't think we should ever tell people in any situation to just like take it if they're uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Because why would you want to live life that way? <laughs> Good one. So with all the like the hate crime towards Asians going on right now, how is California? What, are you in California right now? Currently, yes, I'm in California. Do you know how like how California or in like, you know, anyone in power that's, you know, trying to respond to this or try to protect the Asian communities, basically? Like, how is the U.S. responding to their Asian hate crimes, basically? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's the normal response from a lot of big players of, like, we stand with the Asian community. Great. Like, yes, it's, it's great to see solidarity. Solidarity is very important. But there needs to be more than just solidarity. Like, what are people doing to actually educate themselves or how are people donating or how are people like mobilizing that I'm not so sure of. I haven't really had the time to dig into like what our government is going to do, if anything, to um, like protect different communities. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for you just because Honestly, my, my response the past week after I saw um, all the news was to step back. Like I decided to step back to collect my thoughts, my emotions, to kind of guard my mental health um, and emotional health. 
um, until I was ready to come back and like start diving into things again. So I have taken on my own, you know, personal action items of looking into what everyone's doing now. Like, I know that there are fundraisers, I know that there are organizations, but what are people doing on a bigger scale? How are people responding to this besides just sharing things on Instagram? That I don't have an answer for yet. Um, And maybe I will soon, but I need to do more research, essentially. Like, that's on me. And I hope that there are other people that feel the same way, that they're also going to take it on to educate themselves more, see what's happening, see where they can fill in the gaps, um, and see how they can influence others around them to do the same. Yeah. So what, like, what kind of other ways that people can do to support Asian communities? Because I know you just mentioned like education, not just posting stuff on Instagram. Um, is there any obviously donating as well that's one of them um is there anything else maybe like buying products from asian owned businesses um like sharing foods or like going to like organizations or fundraisers like you've mentioned as well but is there like anything else that non-asians can do you know that they can support further towards um, an asian person or an asian community Mm. I think one helpful thing is learn how to be an ally. So when you see someone, you know, harassing an Asian person or see someone, or if you see or hear a microaggression, like what can you do as a bystander? Um, There are resources out there that kind of teach you what to do. Of course, donating is also helpful if you look into the right organizations. I'm not going to plug any today. I encourage everyone to do their own research on how they want to donate and spend their money. Um, I think also getting out of your bubble and talking to people that may not share the same views as you. I not necessarily to change their mind on anything, but I think it's always helpful to hear others point of view, maybe so you can combat it, but also just so you know, like the other thoughts that are out there. Um, I think we've talked about a lot of ways that people can get involved, but as much as I just said, like, Mary, don't share on Instagram. Instagram is a great place to start (laughs) because people are sharing resources. People are sharing guides and they're all very easily digestible. So if you look at the stop Asian hate hashtag, you'll probably be able to find, you know, quick little resources you can send to your friends send to your family, share for yourself, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, And also check your privilege. Like that's a big one. As a non-Asian person or like me who's mixed, look at your life, look at, you know, the ways in which it differs from those around you and how can you use your standing to lift up the ones that don't have as much privilege as you do? Yeah. Okay. So are there any resources or charities that people can actually donate to? I mean, you can share it with me and then I can put it in the links or below somewhere on this podcast or on this YouTube channel. But yeah, Um, is there anything, any resources that you think that you can pass on to me and then I can pass on to the listeners uh, at this moment? Yeah. Hi, listeners. I don't have a list in front of me, (laughs) but I will compile one. After this call, I'll pull together a list of some uh, foundations, some resources, some guides, and I'll send them them along. (laughs) You can share them. But I, once again, encourage everyone to do their own research because it's really easy to like click a button and donate to a place that someone tells you to donate. But I think it's more meaningful to really comb through things yourself and you may learn in the process, you know, (laughs) some things that you may not have thought of before. So I'll make a list, I'll share it with you, but also listeners do some research. Yeah. Do own due diligence. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we are now at the end of the podcast. First off, thank you so much, Serena, for getting on this podcast with me and talking about um, a, a subject that's obviously very near and dear to our hearts, obviously. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time of your day to come and talk to me on this podcast. Uh, yeah. Are there any last of words? Course. 
Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Last words. I would say first off, and I should have said this first, I'm not an expert by any means on any of this, but I'm happy to come and have a discussion about it with you. And I encourage anyone who's listening, if you disagree with anything I say, or if you want to talk more about it, yes, reach out to me somehow. I'm sure (laughs) Belinda can put my contact information somewhere. But, you know, these are just the thoughts of a woman who's trying to wrap her head around a hate crime that's been affecting her community, right? That's me. And they're a bit jumbled. They're a bit all over the place. They need to be refined, but they're my thoughts and they're my feelings. And it's been lovely being able to share them with you. Um, And I'm stoked to support this podcast because Belinda's awesome. (laughs) And I'm sure I'll be back again. (laughs) Oh, we'll definitely see you again. So wait, where can people find you? What's your Instagram, social media handles? Sure. So my Instagram is Serena Dipity. It's a pun. So it's my name, S-E-R-E-N-A. Dipity T E A at the end. Um, technically, I'm private, but you know, shoot me a message. I could respond. <laughs> Maybe I'll make it public when this podcast goes live. But otherwise, you know, Belinda, you know where to find me. If there's anyone that wants to chat, send them my way. Always down to make new friends as well and have discussions. But I do want to also say that. You know, I have a lot of friends that have a lot more to say about this than I do. So if you want to talk to some other people, too, I can tell you where to find them because they will have plenty to say on this topic as well. Wow. You and your connections. I always feel like you always have like the best people around you because they're always just so well educated. And so they have so much to say. Um, But definitely. Yeah, like you. Oh, thank you. (laughs) I'm so touched uh, but yeah um okay we're gonna wrap it up now thank you so much Serena again for coming on this podcast and thank you to you guys at home uh listening to this podcast and um taking the time to actually learn about um Asian hate crimes and what's happening in the U.S. and a little bit of what's happening in the U.K. as well but thank you so much for taking the time to listen and I'll see you in my next podcast bye bye